Our next speaker is uh, Niladri Basu, who we recruited from Canada based on his cutting edge work on mercury exposure in wildlife. Great, so this on the screen is actually the ancient alchemic symbol for mercury. Now, if you look really careful at this symbol, I think you can see the devil inside mercury. <laughs> mercury really is a devilish substance. I've been studying this chemical for about a decade now, and in all of my readings and research, it really has no biological role in our body. All the research we've done in my laboratory and laboratory of my collaborators have shown quite clearly that mercury is toxic at very, very low concentrations. And mercury really is a devilish compound when it comes to public health. We find mercury in many products that we deem beneficial for public health. So for example, dental amalgams, those silver amalgams that some of you may have in your mouth, they may contain up to 50% mercury by weight. Compact fluorescent light bulbs, the swirly bulbs that we're told to purchase that's gonna fix the energy crisis, they each contain about five milligrams of mercury inside them. Uh, childhood vaccines, I won't even go there given all the hubbub about the presence of mercury in childhood vaccines. And perhaps the most important route by which you and I are exposed to mercury is fish. Every single fish out there has mercury in it. Some fish have little mercury in it and some fish have a lot of mercury in it. All fish have mercury in them. All fish also have beneficial nutrients in them. And that poses a major dilemma to public health. Do we eat the fish or don't we eat the fish? And it's with the presence of mercury in all of these products that we run a laboratory here at the University of Michigan. So I run a laboratory every winter semester in which we lecture to our students the risks and benefits of mercury, but also we teach them how to measure it in themselves. So in this example, data compiled from the last two years of doing the lab, uh, what the students essentially do is they work in teams, they snip each other's hair, they process that hair, they put it into a machine that measures mercury in it, but then they also work to design a survey. They ask each other how much fish they ate, and what types of fish they ate. And what you see quite clearly here is that individuals that eat more fish also have more levels of mercury in their body. And this has been shown many, many times again in research. None of these levels are harmful at all. These are pretty low levels of mercury exposure. But the point is here is that we have a great opportunity through our educational schemes to increase understanding of mercury through, uh, uh, through laboratory exercises. Now every year I try to join the students in this exercise. And last year when I did, this is my value, way up there. <laughs> it's perplexing, it's much higher, it's clearly much higher than those of the students, and it's about five to 10 times higher than the mercury levels I usually find in my own body. And this really perplexed me. When I tried to explain this result by looking at the survey, nothing on the survey could explain it. It wasn't tuna, it wasn't shark, it wasn't swordfish, it was none of those, it was something else. And that was the moment when I had a moment of surprise, when I realized that a month before, I was not here, I was up here in the Arctic. And we were up in the Arctic doing research in Greenland, studying polar bears. And we actually had an opportunity to eat polar bears, okay? We also ate a variety of country foods, such as ring seals, pilot whale, and a whole range of fish, in addition to the polar bear. And the truth is that these are foods that have been consumed for centuries up in the Arctic. They're culturally appropriate foods, highly, highly nutritious, uh, spiritually vowed in a way that we can't comprehend down here. But the reality is, is that these are some of the most polluted foods on the planet. And it's an irony. It's an irony because there is no mercury up there. All the mercury that we release, as I'll show you later, comes from here. It gets dumped in the Arctic where it builds up in the food chains and contaminates the food. And this is the real basis for the research that we do up in the Arctic. So I'm a firm believer that when you do biology and when you do science, you need to get out into the field, you need to get dirty in your work. And I've been doing work in the Arctic for about a decade, and in the last few years, we've taken great strides in establishing an international field station in central East Greenland, which I show you on the map here. That's a satellite image taken of our field station in the summertime, and here I encircle the field station, which is called the Kaptoven Field Station. It was formerly an abandoned schoolhouse, which we've converted into a field station. Here's a better view of the field station taken last year during our trip, and many nights were like this, okay? It was a spectacular place to work out of. This is our team, uh, a picture taken of the team during the day. It was comprised of preeminent scientists, not only from the US and Canada, but from Denmark and Norway. Uh, and uh, again, this is a team that was doing all the research. A lot of days look like this, it's the Arctic. <laughs> 
And if you look carefully in the background, you can actually see this field uh, station just a couple meters away. And in the foreground, we have one of our intrepid soldiers out running errands. And really, the visibility was just a few meters. And you don't know what's around the corner when the weathers look like this. So it, it, it was a little harrowing at times being up there. This is yours truly actually engaged in some discussions. I do want to point out that in the background, that sea ice, you can actually navigate through it. And one of the anecdotes we heard up there is that maybe five, ten years ago, this was covered in ice. In the month of February, this should be covered in ice. And it's only been in the last few years where local knowledge has told us that they're seeing something change in the environment. That all of a sudden, this ice which has been here for centuries is now breaking apart. And you can actually navigate boats through this water. I showed this picture just to come back to that indigenous perspective, and I just want to emphasize that this is really a community health project. Uh, it's not a project where us as scientists just go up to the Arctic because it's a cool thing to do. Rather, given what I told you earlier, that we know that some of the most polluted foodstuffs and polluted areas are up in the Arctic, people up there have a great concern. And in this case, Inuit populations across the pole have expressed this concern, and scientists have been working with them over the last decade or so trying to make sense of this. So here we have the local elder in the community engaged in discussion with one of our senior scientists. So again, we work very closely with the local Inuit, and this is one of the hunters that we were working with. And if you look through his binoculars, you'll see not one polar bear, but three polar bears. And here they are up close. They're cute, and we did not kill them, okay? <laughs> so one mom and two cubs. And in Greenland, like many other parts of the north, you cannot kill mom and cubs. But with that being said, again, polar bears have been hunted for centuries. They've been hunted because they afford great food for people that live up there, great shelter, great uh, apparel. And because of that, there is a quota. Uh, male polar bears can be hunted in Greenland, East Greenland, and that's what we were up there doing. We weren't hunting ourselves. We were working with the local Inuit hunters who are allowed to hunt. We're not allowed to hunt. But what we can do is essentially serve as scavengers at the bequest of the Inuit meaning that when they hunt the bear, we go in and we take a couple samples to assess issues such as what Dr. Meeker was talking about earlier, related exposure and some type of health outcome. So in this case, we're taking a blood sample from a polar bear. And we'll use this blood sample to figure out how much mercury is in that bear's body and also what type of hormones are in that body, what other health impacts that may be related to the mercury or other chemicals, for example. Take a look at that blood sample it's probably got 100 times more mercury in it than you or I do. Okay? In fact, if you uh, survey Inuit in the north and northern people, if you look at many animals in the north, they likely have 100-fold the amount of mercury in their bodies that we do down here. 100 years ago, well, 100 years ago, the Arctic was relatively clean. We've been able to do some sophisticated studies looking at archived museum specimens and sediment cores, and look back at the situation in the 1800s and found it to be relatively clean. And it's really in the past 100 years where we've seen this precipitous increase in the amount of mercury in the Arctic, perhaps tenfold than it was in the 1800s. 100 tons. That's how much mercury we release as a society into the environment every one to two weeks. So about 100 tons of mercury is going up into the air every one to two weeks. 100 days. Once that mercury gets inside your body, it's probably going to stick around for 100 days, if not much longer. The half-life of mercury is 100 days, meaning that if you take in a little bit of mercury now, 100 days later, there's still going to be a substantial amount of mercury in your body. And then 100% confidence. As scientists, we're told to be skeptical of our work, but I think based on my own experience in the Arctic and based on some of these facts and results that we've collected, our collaborators have collected, I'm pretty much 100% sure that this issue of mercury pollution or just pollution at the poles is really for real. So what I want to do now is just to talk about some of the underlying science. And of course, there are many, many questions. And as a human society, I think the first question is, well, who's to blame? It's you and I, and about the 7 billion other people on this planet. Because many of us, not all of us, but many of us live a very unsustainable lifestyle. And to live this lifestyle, we rely upon energy. And most of the energy that we rely upon is non-renewable. A lot of it in this country especially comes from coal. And if you think back to a fact I told you earlier, 100 tons of mercury coming out every one to two weeks, well, a lot of that comes from coal. Every time you burn coal, you not only release uh, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide into the environment, but you also release a fair amount of mercury into the environment too. So then the next question, how is it that the coal that we burn here in the Midwest makes its way up into the Arctic? Well, there's this really nice process called global distillation. 
basically saying that chemicals like mercury that are volatile at these lower latitudes that are a little bit warmer, once they get into the air, they're active, they can move around, but the closer they get to the Arctic or the closer they get to colder environments, they tend to slow down, they tend to move less, and ultimately they get deposited in the Arctic landscapes and they don't move again. So that's why we often hear about the Arctic as a sink for pollution. Once that mercury gets there, once other pollutants get there, they generally can't leave there. It's a sink for pollution. Next, once that chemical is there, how is it that it makes its way up into the polar bear? And it's a very simple process known as trophic transfer, uh, where we have small animals being predated upon by larger animals. Ultimately, we get to the top of the food chain. So here's a very simple schematic from a report we recently wrote on the x-axis going from left to right is increasing concentration of mercury, and from the bottom to the top is increasing trophic position. And clearly, you can see that at the top of this food chain are the polar bears, and in fact, the concentrations of mercury in the tissues of these bears might be one million times greater than the concentrations of mercury that we find in the air or the water in the Arctic. So there's this phenomenal biomagnification that occurs. And then on top of this, when you throw humans into the mix and we start consuming these upper level organisms, we are even exposed to that much more mercury. So again, this is what really drives our work in the Arctic, that there is no source of mercury in the Arctic. Uh, but unfortunately, because of some chemistry and some biomagnification processes, some of the most contaminated organisms and people live up in the Arctic. And if you think about it just carefully, it really represents an issue of environmental justice at a global level. So with that being said, this is going to be my final slide, and I want to end off with a quote, which is, we are the land and the land is us. When our land and animals are poisoned, so are we. Well, realize that a year ago, I just came back from Greenland, where I kind of ate off the land for a month. I had a couple meals of country food, not that much, and my mercury levels increased five, tenfold. Not to levels that are harmful, but nonetheless, they increased pretty substantially. And you would think that me, who's been studying mercury for a while, would know that if you're going to go to a place like Greenland and eat country food, that your mercury levels are going to spike. I've been studying mercury for a while. I sit on panels concerning mercury in the Arctic. I've authored reports on this issue. So you'd think I'd know this going in, but I was stunned. And it really was that moment of surprise that really made the science hit home, where science and sort of my personal life came together. And uh, I think it's really important as a scientist to tell this to people. Uh, with that being said, maybe I'll try to personalize this for you a little bit more too. So here we are in Michigan, in the heart of the Great Lakes. Just realize that almost every single lake and river in Michigan and in the Great Lakes has a fish consumption advisory, largely because of mercury. If we extend this to the country, the US, about half the lakes and rivers have fish consumption advisories because of mercury. That's how ubiquitous of a problem this is. Let's overlay this quote this, uh, to this. We are the land, and, uh, and when our land and animals are poisoned, so are we. Well, if there's that much mercury out there, I bet that if you give me your blood sample, I can measure mercury in it. Okay? I can detect mercury in every single one of you out there. And then on top of that, there's been some compelling studies to show that one out of every six women of childbearing age likely has levels of mercury in their body that might be damaging to their fetus. That's one out of every six in this country. And if you look around here and start doing the math, th these are real lives being affected. And then right now we hear a lot about the economy and the economic downturn. Well, mercury also has a, an economic cost. And there's been a conservative estimate that mercury pollution every single year in this country costs us eight to $40 billion. That's billion with a B. So the last thing I want to say is maybe a little bit more lighthearted and on a positive note. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I've thought that I shouldn't really be doing the work that I'm doing, that I shouldn't have a job. Uh, everything we know about mercury says that mercury is not good. And in fact, we have solutions. We have a lot of solutions, whether they're technological solutions or behavioral solutions. Solutions do exist to mitigate this mercury issue. Unfortunately, we need a little bit of money and a lot of political willpower to make this happen. And there's been a lot of talk about solving this mercury issue right now, and hopefully in the next few years. I'd like to remain in my job, maybe we said something different. Thank you. <laughs>